、えー、移らせていただきます。あまずはあの今日ご参加の皆様、えー、このですね、いっぱいよろしくお願いいたします。では、まず、えー、基調講演となります。えー台湾でオープンソース活動を行っていらっしゃいます、えー、フランクリン・ウェンさんからですね、えー、パブリックマネー、パブリックコード、えー、それは何か、私、そして、えー、なぜ私たちの政府がそれを採用する必要があるのか、というタイトルで、えー、ご講演をいただきたいと思います。えー、フランクリンさん。はい。そう。OK、let me. So you can see my screen now, right? Okay. 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 Fine. Okay. Fine. Okay. So let's start. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon.、Uh, this is Franklin from Taiwan. And it's my second time to be invited as a keynote speaker in LibreOffice Kaiji. So I know that LibreOffice Kaiji is more local Japanese, Japanese event, so it's my honor <laughs> to be invited again. So today I'm going to talk about this topic called public money, public code. It looks like、uh, not related to LibreOffice or ODF, but actually it is. It is. So today I will give an introduction to this. What is this PMPC and why we should adopt it in our government? In recent years, we have promoted uh, uh, LibreOffice and the Open Document Format in our government for 10 years. In the recent years, we talk more about this PMPC together with ODF. Okay, so first, What is PMPC? It is actually a campaign started by Free Software Foundation Europe. It starts from Europe. And in the, it's in started from 2017. And here we have a, a link. It's a Japanese version, Japanese version introduction. You can check it later. Yeah, okay. So, first, what is that?、Uh, what, what this PMPC is talking about is actually so we know that every money, every yen, every dollar, cent, penny, anyway, as long as it is spent by the government, those money is from taxpayers, right? So, who are the taxpayers? We are the taxpayers. So, Do we have the right to get at the least to see what they are doing? I know we have some representatives in the gov-、uh, to, to monitor what government is doing, but we are the taxpayers. The money is from us. Do we have the right to do that at least for the digital service? What software or system are they using? And the more important is that how will those software or system affect us? Here, uh, uh, I will need to,、uh, to say this、uh, early. So, when we say the public money, of course, we're talking about the tax money, but actually, it is a lot more than that. Not only about the tax money, it's actually about the public benefits. Okay, later we will go to this concept again. So, now let's Discuss a bit about the current status in many, many most countries. Usually,、uh, almost always, the public government administrations, anyway, usually choose to close the software not sharing with others. I mean, yeah, the government unit spends the budget to buy software or to build a system. Yeah, then that will say, hey, that's our budget. So you don't have the right to use this. The, the you, I mean, maybe other government units, right? These government units build this, and I, well, they, they will say that, oh, no, you don't have the right to use this. But for us, for us taxpayers, yeah, that's your budget, but that's our money. 
right? That's our money. So using this way, usually they close so we're to avoid others looking at it or or using that, it actually creates this called monopolies. That means uh, as long as you can see, you can see almost, uh, I'm, I'm sure it's more than 90% of software or system the government is using, it's mostly dominated by a number of big companies like Microsoft, like Google, like IBM, right? So you can see, as long as you can check those uh, big projects from government, you can see most, especially big software projects, they are all built by big companies, right? So that creates some hindering because other competitors is very difficult to get into this. And it also creates a problem that if something is wrong, if something is wrong, like a security issue backdoor, actually it's very difficult to get that fixed. Actually, it depends on those big companies. If they don't want to fix it, it's very possible, I, I need to remind you, if they don't want to fix that, we have no way to get it done because they forbid us to access the code, right? So uh, I think maybe I will explain a bit more to get, make you easier to understand this concept. So, so let's explain it by government software tenders. First, first, the government body will need to achieve something. So they will need to buy or lease here, buy or lease, they can lease, okay? Oh, sorry. They can, they can buy or lease software. Uh, but if there is no existing software that can achieve the goals, they may commission a software vendor to build it. So they will start a tender, they will start a bid project. Okay, and then, this tender, this type of tender, we they will list what features we want, what standards and the specifications we need to be met and verified, right? So this feature, this feature, this feature, you need to have this feature, this feature, this feature, right? And when the final product is delivered, those features and standards are checked one by one. Okay, this is, down check, this is down check, this is down check, right? Oh, this is not done. So, okay, you failed, you failed the product, you need to fix that. And everyone, every features are met, every feature, every requirements are met, okay, you pass. So we pay you for this product. So that's a normal everyday practice. And it seems fine, so what is the problem? This process, what is the problem? It, the problem actually relies on something they don't tell you. The problem is on something they don't tell you. Okay, here, my own real life experience. I used to be the leader of an RD team in a company. We were developing surveillance devices like cameras, the DVI's digital video recorder, then we as network video recorders. We do the surveillance devices. And we were asked, we were asked to add a backdoor account and password. Or add a series of keystrokes like up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, BA, something like that. We were asked to add something like that. And when the user hits the keystrokes or input the account and password, they could get the highest authorizations immediately. That's a typical backdoor, right? Who asked? Customer service, application engineers, those who need to face the customers. Why? Because 
usually when they face customers, when they face customer complaints, usually, actually, almost always, the client, the customer won't know, won't remember what the account the password is. So for customer service, for the application engineers, if they have such a backdoor account or keystroke so they can get the to get the highest authorities, it's very convenient for them to solve customers' power, right? So it's a sake of convenience for them, for the customer service. But you have to know that always, always convenience and uh, security is opposite. Maybe, maybe it can be accepted if the part, this problem is in a normal market, like what do we say, TV, we are in the normal, normal market. Maybe, but what if it's in the government? In the government, there are millions of citizens' private data in hand, right? Is that acceptable? That's our question. Yes, in, the, in this tender, all the requirements are met, right? But is there anything also in the system but not in the requirements list? I can assure you that always, almost always, there must be something in the system that they don't tell you. I can assure you. Maybe it's a bug or a bug that uh, looks like a feature, maybe. Maybe it's not malicious, maybe. But in the government's digital service with millions of citizens' private data in there, do we want to risk that? Another uh, funny example is, is when the pandemic starts. When the pandemic starts in Taiwan, the Taipei was blocked uh, for a few weeks and the people need to stay home, schools are closed, so the old classes are turned to online, right? So at the first, they're using, they were using Zoom, Z-O-M, Zoom, to, to do the online classes. But not long after that, someone found that when you are doing uh, online conference using Zoom, they will send something, send something to a server in Beijing. What did they send? We don't know, but they will send something to a server in Beijing. So, you know, uh, especially here, sending something without notifying you, and to anywhere, it, it is not acceptable, especially to Beijing, it's a big no-no. So, so suddenly every school or asked to stop using Zoom, right? So that's just an example. Actually, any system might have some, send something to somewhere for research and analysis, right? But you will never know that. Okay, that's one problem. Then the second problem is vendor lock in. After a system is online for a while, new requirements will, will arise, right? So new tenders will be generated. We will need to meet the new requirements. So usually they will follow the same formal procedures and the bidding process. But if you are not the original developers, it would be very, very difficult to bid that project. And if you really get that project, it will be very difficult to get the source from the original team. And actually, I don't know how many of you are server developers, but I know an experienced server developers uh, is really, uh, we really don't like to trace someone else's code. It's a pain in the ass, really, because it's very difficult to, to do that. And then another problem is that what if the original team didn't give you the correct code? Hey, our original team, we lost the bid or lost the second bid, right? So we no longer get the money from that. Why should I help you? Okay, maybe in the contract, we need to give you source code, but we can make the source code 
extremely difficult for you to read, right? That's very, very possible. So if you are not the original developer, it's almost impossible to be the second or, or follow in tenders uh, with the new requirements, right? Third, how to evaluate the money they use. Actually, this one, uh, I can use a real true story here. I used to read a uh, uh, tender from the government and it's, uh, it's already bid by a big company. And it's, it's really a uh, thousand millions. Okay, it's really a big amount of money. And uh, in their project plan, they listed thousand million of dollars only used for developing tools, not final product only for developing tools like database, gateway, project management system, QA, firewall, something like that, only for developing tools. So my question here is, hey, all for all these tools, how many of them have other choices? Actually, what I'm ask, I was asking is, do any of open source tools can be used to, to for this project? Do we really need to spend so much cost just for these developing tools. And uh, another interesting question is how many of them does Revent already have? They may already have these systems they can use on this project, but at least they say they want to buy, they want to purchase these for these projects developing, but actually they may not spend any money on this. They just get the money for their own use, right? So how can we evaluate that? So then this is a price value gap. And, and also I use examples to, to explain maybe it's easier. I like to ask people when, when we were promoting open document format and deep office, I like to ask people that, hey, I know you are using Microsoft Word. So do you know how many features in Microsoft Word? Okay, let's say 1,000, all right? Well, it's really not important because my real question is, how many features do we use? How many features do we use in Microsoft Word? Let alone that when we buy Microsoft Office, even I just want to use Microsoft Word, I still need to buy the whole suite, right? Including Microsoft Access something or Outlook, something like that. I don't really need to use that, but I need to buy it. So the question here is, how many features do we use? And these features, can they be satisfied by other, maybe cheaper software? Is it worth buying the whole suite just for a few features you want to use? That is price and value for for here, the value for you is just the feature you use. But the price might be a lot more. So is that really worth buying the whole suite? Okay. Up to now, we're still talking about the problems we see in the government. Here, another example. This example is a very good, very perfect example about the PMPC. It's called Taiwan Social Distance. It is an app on the mobile device. This app is uh, developed during the pandemic. And this, what does this app do? This app notifies, notifies a user that if he was in a place, in a place, uh, he was at the same place with someone who was infected by COVID-19 for too long, like two minutes. If they detect you stay here and there's another one already infected by COVID-19 and you stay at the same place for more than two minutes, they will warn you because you are at high risk. At that time, we still don't know how they transmit from one to one, but we just know that it's e very easy to transmit. But the, so so that this app warn you that you stay here with someone infected too long. 
So you need to be careful, very careful. Okay, this is a very important for uh, at that time. So we try to uh, we try to avoid the transmission. But wait, does that mean that the app monitors where we go every moment? moment? Or how could you know that I'm at this place with someone who was infected? If you don't monitor where I go everywhere, hey, I'm going to meet my lover. I don't want my wife to know, but do you monitor where I'm going? Are you kidding? So at that time, at that time, the development team director jumped out explaining how they were doing that. They explained that no, 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 it's not like what you say. We they they uh they Give, they gave uh, explain how they do the organization is explained, never invade the user's privacy. Actually, that's good, that's very good because they explain how the organization is doing and they promise that they never invade user's privacy, but the only problem here now is how do we know if you really follow the organization? It's not that we don't trust you. No, they you, you have to know that the development team of Taiwan Social Distance, they do this pro bono. Pro bono means they don't get any money from that. They they are all volunteer work and they think this is very important for the uh for for avoid avoid getting infected in during this pandemic, they are doing great things and we appreciate them very much, but this is a general concern, not just against them. This is a general concern. How do we know if you really follow the organism? So the only solution here is you need to open your source for us to examine, right? If we can look at your source code, we can make sure that yes, you really follow oxygen and that our private data is safe. So they finally, yes, they opened the source uh, under the help of uh, Audrey Tom at that time. So they opened the source. So this is a perfect example of PNPC. They gain public trust by opening the source to us because this app is very important and highly related to users, to everyone's private privacy, right? So this is what we are talking about. The core idea behind PMPC is that software and system purchase leads or built by taxpayers' money should be made available for public acquisition. Acquisition means we can get them and we can get them freely. Inspection, we can look at them freely and reuse when we need that. So, so in order to gain the public acquisition, inspection and reuse, they have to under a free and open source software license. So that's the core idea behind PNPC. So now let's talk about what the PMPC solve. First, it's a substantial savings on license fee. Here I need to emphasize this. What they are saving, what they save is license fees, not necessary total cost. Not a necessary total cost. Here, when you apply PMPC, the software needs to uh, need to need to be under open source license. And when the government body needs to develop a new software system, they should first evaluate if there's any existing open source software systems. And with such systems, they don't need to purchase the license fee, right? So all the costs, all the budget, you can focus on customization, on customized service. You can focus on service, not spending it on software license fees. So you focus, your, maybe it's not a lot less than license fees, but at least you are spending the money on services. So this is where you, they can get better suited. Maybe the 
existing open source software system may 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 only satisfy you maybe sixty percent, fifty percent, but you can spend your cost on customize it to meet your requirement, right? Not on buying license fees. The second is re avoid repeating the development. That's what I said in the beginning, right? The government body used the budget to 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 buy a software and they say they say no, you cannot use mine because that's my money. No, but with PMPC, we can find that different government body may have overlap needs. Maybe again, fifty percent, sixty percent uh, overlapped. So each one, each body can focus their budget on customize their own requirements. And uh, the result can be reused again, but again, when they were reused, they may only satisfy maybe 70%. So the third unit will spend some cost to customize for themselves, right? Anyway, tender can be put out and customized. So that's the, the point. The third, avoid vendor lock in. Here we're talking about, you have to know that, especially for those big companies, there is very, very likely that for some issues, they don't want to fix that because it's cost effect, it's not cost effective. Of course, for that, for that, uh, for that situation, there may be some responsibilities or even lawsuits. That's not a problem. But here, what, what we're talking about here is that if such situation happens, at least with PMPC, because it's open source, so we can have another door. We can have another way to commission other vendors and authoritative individuals to do the work, to fix the problems, Right, we don't need to be locked by the original vendor. We don't need to be rely on the original vendor because it's open source. So if you really don't want to do, of course, we we may have some lawsuit or or some responsibility to, to be clarified. But at least we have we have another way. The government have another way to commission others to do the work if it's really important necessary. The first is about transparency. Yeah, just like what I, I, I talk about, uh, how do we evaluate, evaluate the tender? How do we evaluate the so vendor really, really do the right thing? Or at the least, your solar quality is good enough and to gain the public trust, right? So the transparency is something only open source software can provide, but not proprietary closed software, right? So here is a concept about public service provided by the government, including digital service. Uh, this, this concept is about that um, these public services, including digital service, should be provided wherever there is demand, regardless of use rate, like this picture. It is a barrier free ramps, right? So can you say when you build the buildings, can you say that, oh, 99% of people are healthy and they can walk there by themselves. So we don't need these barrier free ramps because only a few people will use that. Can you say that? Of course not, right? Because these barrier free ramps are for, we need to make sure everyone can get into the, Buildings without problem. Everyone. It's the same to digital service. Or as, again, we can use uh, some examples to, is, to explain this concept. I believe, I believe that all of you have such experience like this. When we want to apply something online for government service, and we go to the website, but that website can only be accessed correctly by IE browser. That happens many, uh, many years ago, but it happens all the time, right? Only IE, IE only websites. When we are uh, referring the problem to the government, they always told us, oh, main, most people use IE, so that's not a problem. But can you say that? I don't have IE because I don't have Windows system. 
so I cannot use the service because I don't have I because I don't have a Windows system. I don't want to buy a Windows system, so I cannot use your service. This problem uh, terminated after the iPad and iPhone was invented because on iPhone and iPad there is no IE on that, and the government finally found that oh they cannot access the service using iPad or I using iPhone. <laughs> Right, Microsoft Office is, uh, is another example. Is uh, uh, they provide a document for you to apply something, but they can only be opened correctly by Microsoft Office, even for certain version of Microsoft Office. So for us, we don't have Microsoft Office. We reflect the problem for them, but they always told us, "Oh, everyone have Microsoft Office." No, it's not true. So that's why we need to use open standards here. So that's what where all the parts fits into PMPC. If we are applying PMPC, if we are applying PMPC, all the system, all the software, no matter you buy it or 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 build it, they need to meet, they need to use open standards. They need to use open standard because it's for the interoperability. So that's why we, in recent years, we have promoted OTF in government for 10 years, but recently, recent years, we combined, we combined ODF policy and the PMPC policy together. Okay. So finally, we have about 10 minutes left. Uh, finally, let's talk about the security issues. That's a very, very common question we heard, a common misunderstanding. They will say, if the code is open, people will look for its security weakness through the source code, then insert Trojan horses or something like that. So the conclusion is that free and open source software is less secure than proprietary software. I believe many of you, almost all of you have already heard of that. Is that true? That's what we are going to discuss here. So to discuss this, first we can uh, talk about CVE. CVE is common vulnerability oh i never pronounced that right common vulnerabilities <laughs> and exposures that means the, it is a database uh all the security problems reported by certain software by certain software it is recorded in this in this uh in this database so we can compare between the Microsoft Office and LibreOffice during 2011. 2011 is the, the year LibreOffice announced to 2022 when I wrote the manual letter, I'll talk about that. These years, all these years, we can find that almost 500 security problems reported here, but only nearly 50 in LibreOffice. And for the high risk issues, Microsoft Office has Two two seven nine, with deep office only twenty one. So here the point here is what I'm going to say is uh, we can clearly see uh, most 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 security issues are not found by researching the source code. Okay, so actually open source or closed source is not really that highly related to the security issues. So here we provide some point of view for the security issues. First, no server can be guaranteed 100% free of security problems. No one can guarantee it. So the real issue here is not if this server will have security problems. We can almost assure that they will have security issues. But we should focus on how to deal with them. How to deal with them means here we have three perspectives. First, of course, 
the important is software quality. If the software quality is better, the lower the chance of problem, right? They can be achieved by doing some source uh, source scan. <laughs> right? they, they can find out some uh, some possible problems here that may cause problems. So that's the social quality. The second is responsiveness. That means when an issue is found or even reported, can the development team respond quickly, fix that quickly, and uh, make the fix public, publish the fix it quick enough. They may, uh, it's possible that the developing has no activity at all. So the security issue is there for years, but without anyone fix them. That just like Apache Open Office, they, they have the, such problems, right? The third is the transparency. When things go wrong and the, the development team declares that they fix the issues, do they really get that fixed or they just cover the problem, but not deal with the root cause? So with the three above uh, three perspectives, you can clearly see that with security problems in free software that deal with, the fix are made public, right? Uh, if the development really fix that, yes or no, they can be they can be examined, they can be looked at. But for those commercial company for the proprietary software, they claim they fix, but we have no way to evaluate that. Those fix are in a black box. And furthermore, furthermore, those security issues can be ignored entirely if fixing them is not cost effective. Example, flash. You know flash, a web, web animation, animation right? Uh, it is dead now, but why is it dead? Because it has so many security issues, but Adobe refused to fix them because it is not cost effective for them. We don't, they don't think they need to, to put any more costs to fix all these problems. So they just let them die. It's very likely for commercial company because it's the benefit problem. So as long as the software is still being actively developed, the so security should not be a concern for fraud. That does not mean for the won't have free and open source software, won't have any security problem. No, they still may have, but or it does not mean that once you use uh, open source software, you no longer need to worry about that. No, it's not, it's not like that. But with its open source nature, the problem can be found and fixed by anyone. Even the original developers don't want to do that anymore. If it's important enough, there are still others can do the work. At least the way is there, right? But if it is closed source, it's it proprietary software, there's no way to do that uh, without the original developers. And the modification can be also reviewed. So is it really, is it really uh, fixed? So I don't know if you have, you remember the uh, XZ security issues in the beginning of this year? Yeah, so they they were planned by some malicious code inside, but how can they be found? Because it is open source, right? So with this kind of transparency, cannot be provided by closed software, provide software. So the conclusion, public money, public code is related to the public benefits. Everything the government does is related to the public benefits. So it's important to be transparent. That's the PMPC core concept. Budget, of course, uh, budget can be focused on providing customization service, not server license fee. It's just one of the benefits of PMPC, but it's also an important one. So that's the introduction of the PMPC. And actually, we combine this with all the policies recent years, and we, we believe that it's very important. Uh, we not we are not just only promoting ODF now. We 
uh, in Taiwan, in Taiwan, these two years, we start a series of projects about, we say, public coal. Yeah, we were trying to go into this way. Okay, finally, uh, leave off Asia conference in August 2 and 3 in Taipei. I hope, uh, I really hope to see you there. Okay. Okay, so that's my talk today. But since this is an online, online, uh, I'm not sure if we can understand the question you you are asking anyone, but anyway, uh, I I wrote a menu about this. I wrote a menu about this, uh, public money, public code, and uh, it can get here. I wrote it for a foundation in Germany, and the the target audience of this menu is for the government, German government, and the German NPO NGOs. But you are welcome to. To read it, and uh, if you have any question or further discussions, you can email me. Okay, that's my talk today. Thank you very much.